Okay, hello, my name is uh, Gijs de Heij, uh, and I'm here to talk about the uh, Kin Arts Almanac, this book um, that was designed by Open Source Publishing, uh, a collective, uh, Brussels-based collective, uh, using only uh, free and open source software. Uh, and I'm a member uh, of this collective, uh, OSP, uh, as the abbreviation of it is, um, exists for 18 years now. I've not been a part uh, of it for those 18 years. I'm a member of it uh, for 10 years. And um, just when I joined it, I also went for my, to my first LGM in Leipzig, which is also 10 years ago. So for me, it's very exciting to do a talk now. Um, so our, well, first maybe do a tiny, tiny introduction of OSP and our practice in the sense that uh, when it started, um, it was an attempt at having a graphic design practice using only free and open source software. And this experiment proved quite quickly quite, uh, possible. And for me, the, the practice has shifted towards uh, a looping sentence, this practice shapes tools shape practice that has been developed by or written by uh, Pierre Huigbaard. And for me, it, it highlights uh, a, a question which is about our practice using a different set of tools than traditional designers. Um, maybe also becomes different and what's the influence of those tools on our practice maybe good to say is that this sentence was uh, at least the sticker was designed by pierre hagebaard during the libre graphics research <coughs> unit was which was uh, a research project into uh, the possibilities of uh, libre software tools so the book the fair arts almanac um, is designed by OSP, but the material in it uh, is a is a collection of uh, many contributions of over uh, 120 people, I believe. And the project was initiated by State of the Arts. So State of the Arts is uh, a platform, an open platform uh, in Brussels, but more Belgium that tries to reimagine the connections that shape the art world today. So they gather people to specifically ask about issues within the arts field. So a lot of the members of this platform are also active in the arts field, either as uh, artists themselves or maybe working in auxiliary industries like graphic design. So it became the, uh, it started as the uh, Fair, arts, Fair Arts Almanac. Uh, five or six years ago, the first edition was published um, and this second edition is called the Kin Arts Almanac. <clears throat> and so th there's like two questions here, maybe like what is kin um, uh, and, and why did we choose this term? Uh, so maybe to say is that I like a sentence that they wrote uh, in the introduction that says uh, kin, what, what they wrote about kin is recognizing our interdependent relations with each other, including all things and beings is recognizing the kinship we live. Therefore, we wish and speculate to think and set up cultural life from the perspective of kin. So it focuses very strongly on the relationship between the actors in the field. And they found this more appropriate than fair because uh, fair can be uh, unprecise, but more importantly, fair also has an industry or like has a, a history in fair as in a white skin color or blonde hair. So it has also kind of a problematic uh, political history. So this publication was, um, the, the, the process of writing this publication started about four years ago in the middle of the COVID crisis um, through uh, 12 uh, work sessions online, gathering uh, people and asking uh, or reflecting upon uh, the questions of ecology accessibility, parenthood, education, making space, politics, re relationality, property and open source, redistribution, migration, rest, and mutuality. So during these, um, during these sessions, uh, we used a tool called Atertov, and that's actually the thing uh, I would like to talk about uh, today. 
So Atatov is a self-hosted collaborative floss design and publishing tool wrapped around the text editor Etherpad. And what's funny is that actually 10 years ago in uh, uh, the LGM in Leipzig, we announced uh, the summer school Relearn, uh, which, was, uh, which was organized in OSP together with uh, organizations in the, in the local field. And we tried to bring together people who were uh, interested in, uh, in alternative pedagogies. Actually, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is the tool at that moment. And uh, so what Atertov uh, essentially is, is an interface uh, around pads and introduces different modes. So by default, pads can be edited by everyone. But with Atertov, you can introduce a, a read mode where you can uh, read the text but not edit it. And then you can put access control uh, on the right side. So you have a little bit of control uh, on who is able to change the text. And during the summer school, uh, we used this tool or we proposed this tool as, an, as a means to document the event while it was happening, also reducing the workload for us as OSP to work on the documentation after the event. So after this uh, summer school, we've been keeping on developing uh, the tool, for example, during the conference, what's the matter with cooperation? And there we asked the audience to take notes uh, during the conference in Etherpad. And those uh, tools were hosted on a Raspberry Pi uh, within uh, the venue of the conference. Uh, and this made that for us, we could only work on it while the conference was happening. So you see here my colleague Sarah writing CSS on a pad to style, uh, to style the website, but also to style the output. Um, and then at the end of the event, we printed out all the, the pages of the, uh, of the documentation and allowed people uh, to bind it uh, themselves uh, in the space. So like I said, it's uh, Etherpad and everything is a pad. You also write CSS on the pad, which is in many ways a bad idea, but what it actually allows <laughs> is that you can design together because you can, yeah, you can really at the same time work together on how the document looks. And then a little joke, like, of course, no, this is also a pad. Uh, okay. so. What I wanted to do is to give maybe like a tiny demo to show how it looks. So we have here uh, the, the front end. So if you go to almanac.stateofthearts.net, this is what you see. And you have here the different uh, articles. You can open them and read them. So this is the web view. But what I was actually interested or what I wanted to show them today is where it becomes a publishing or editing tool and a design tool is if you go to the back end. So this is what you see if you click on the list button. And what you see here are folders. So they are the, the 12 chapters uh, of the book together with some auxiliary items. So I can open, for example, here, the month of Taurus. And then during the process, we quickly discovered that, you know, there's material that goes into the publication, but there's also material that goes out. So we added, we added a subfolder structure so you can go to publication. There you have other pads. And there we asked the, the contributors uh, to enter the content in Markdown. Mm -hmm. uh, this didn't fully work. Uh, so the contributors didn't do it. We had 12 month editors. We tried as much as possible to have the 12 month editors do that. But like in reality, it also came down to a smaller core team of people who were also learning the, the Markdown syntax for the project. But from this right, uh, mode, you can also go to read mode. And I hope this works. Let's try that again. Okay, I don't know. You should be able to go back to the read mode and then you see the, the content of the article. So this would allow also the contributors to go back and forth. Like even if the, the markdown is then, for example, encoded by somebody else, they can still read the content later on. 
So I wanted to show the, the CSS that we used for the, ah, wait, it's loaded. Yeah, so here we have the, the read mode of this article. There's the CSS used for the print. I mean, I, I guess I just want to show this why this at some point also has its trouble because it's like a lot mm -hmm. and there are like many exceptions that you want to work with for specific chapters. Um, so, sorry, I will go back to the list editor because that's where uh, it becomes, let's say, a publishing tool is that uh, all these pads can be uh, put together in an HTML page and then using paged, uh, JS, their layout is recalculated and uh, laid out on pages together with a table of contents uh, and also page numbers here on the top right, uh, top left and top right. Okay. So that's the tool. Oh, well. So I thought maybe just to say for people who maybe didn't get that yet, or I mean, which is, so pages.js is a JavaScript polyfill um, that emulates the paged media standards. So uh, when you go to paged page media, there is uh, the problem of page numbers, but there's also <laughs> the problem of uh, page breaks. Let me see if I can find a good example. But essentially the screen has an infinite height. So if you have a document that doesn't fit in the screen, you can just make it a little bit bigger and add a scroll bar. But of course with, uh, with a text page, this is hard. So sometimes you run into issues where uh, you would have, for example, a header on the end of the page uh, and you'd rather have it move together with the text to the next page. I think I cannot find an example right now. But there is actually a standard for that that describes the behavior, but it's not implemented by browsers yet. And this is what I really like about the page.js project um, is that it allows designers to already use the standard and show to browsers that this is actually a big necessity and that there is a use for this and it's worth their time to actually implement it. So there are some plugins that we made um, to generate all these QR codes on the right. So the documentation gathers a lot of references and it was important to us that, and these references are often online. So it was important to us that also from the printed book, people could easily access them. So you can scan the QR codes uh, and go to the pages or so yeah, to go to the online resources. And then there is the, the spine text. I hope you can see it. Um, so this was also implemented with uh, pages. Yes, and there's where for me, it becomes really interesting to use a web browser because you have JavaScript uh, and you can use the, like those little tricks uh, and you can start to make them uh, yourself. So there are two divs on top of each other, like one has the text and then the other one has a hidden overflow and then you move the text a little bit up or down with every page. Okay. So I thought to reflect maybe quickly on what I think it added for us to use Flow software. So first one is experiment and joy. So for me, it's really fun to use, to, to learn about the tools that they use, to learn about the technologies that I use also when it comes to, for example, PDFs and the color management of the PDFs, but it also adds more opportunities to experiment by, by coding, by uh, thinking of different processing pipelines, for example, the, what's the matter with cooperation that they showed where there is a sort of local infrastructure present. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that that that's also kind of a privilege of having an understanding client, of having sort of the economic means to take time for this kind of work. Um, there's the, for me, the addition of horizontality and an asynchronous process. So normally maybe with a publishing process, contributors would write their text, submit it to the designer and the designers start to do their thing with it. And if their text modifications, there's this weird negotiation process of contributors complaining and then the designer has to implement it. And here we could put that respons yeah, responsibility also on the contributors and ask them to, to do the edits themselves. But it also makes the whole process more, um, more open and 
the, the process is let's say less divide like the freezing moment is towards the end and not there are not freezing moments in between can of course also be a bad idea but here it worked uh, i think in terms of the process of design about composability so we used a lot of web tools which from the start are already designed to be tweaked but also to be combined in different ways then there's also slowness and frustration so so a good example of this is that I learned yesterday that there is a fix around it, but in Etherpad, if you paste a big chunk of text, it doesn't work, but it doesn't make an error. So you put your big text, you edit it, you refresh the page and everything is gone. This happens and people lose their time. Then there's closeness. So a lot of the tools that we use uh, in, uh, in this project are developed or are contributed by the people in the room in this room so to have an understanding of the people that make your tools for me is like really special um, and the fluidity of roles so you can <laughs> like we are as designers we're both designers and programmers but also the editors can if they know a little bit of css you know tweak the layout of the book themselves it's not something that is sort of only part of the domain of the designer So I wanted to give thanks. This publication has been made with Floss Software. It was designed and edited with Etertov, the tool based on the collective editor Etherpad. Okay, tooting our own horn, sorry. Originally a web page, PasteJS and Firefox transformed it into PDF. For the tools, HTML, CSS, GIMP, Inkscape, GoScript, MeTools, and PFTK. Fonts, Adelf, Amiami Round, Krix, Dindong, Frances, Latin Modern, Sticks to Text, GGL 016. And then I wanted to come back to practice shapes, tools, shape, practice. Um, because yesterday there was made often in talks, a clear distinction between typical designers and typical programmers. And I think this is a very useful abstraction, but thinking about practice shapes, tools, sh shape, practice, you could put designers on the place of practice and could put, or could replace tools with developers. And I think, in a sort of uh, conventional software, the relationship between the two is very clear and also negoti is negotiated by a contract of, pur of purchase. But for me, within Floss Software, there's the potential for this relationship to be more complex and for people to take more positions within the circle. So I like to think of myself as being um, both a designer and a programmer. And I think it's exactly the, the freedoms of those tools uh, that allow for this position. And I think that's actually a quality that we should not forget about. Um, because Floss tools invite you to learn and also because sometimes they challenge you. <laughs> so uh, final, uh, to, to wrap it all up, uh, I brought some copies for you to uh, browse through. You can read the material also on almanac.stateofthearts.net. OSP.kitchen is our website. We have a page here on the tool. It's unfortunately 10 years old. We're working on making it more accessible at the moment, um, but you can find the repository of the original project here. Um, and if you like the publication, uh, you can also buy them. Uh, here I, I brought some copies uh, for 20 euros uh, or they're also available on the website of the publisher okay are there questions